Welcome to our study in the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education Part 5, and this is Session 1. There's some things that we're going to do in your note taker right off the bat. To set the stage for that, let me explain or remind us of something. We are going through this part of the book of Romans in parallel to the format that was laid down in the book of Proverbs. Uh, when the prophetic program resumes, after this dispensation of grace has come to an end, the believing remnant is going to be edified by a number of books um, that they'll have uh, access to. Among those books will be the book of Proverbs. Uh, when the doctrine is presented to us by Paul, Sometimes that doctrine may itself be a little different, but the format in which the doctrine is presented is the same as it is in Israel's program. Now, what I mean by that is the order in which doctrine is presented and how it builds on itself, that happens in the prophetic program for the remnant. It also happens for us as members of the body of Christ. And again, while the doctrine is, may not be identical, the way the doctrine is presented or the format of it doesn't change. So let me give you an example of that. So I'm going to take you over. This is not in your notes. I'm just reminding you of it. To Proverbs chapter 1. Oh, well, I don't have it on here. I don't know why. Let me just read it to you. In Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment and equity. We have followed those four sonship skills in the book of Romans, starting in Romans 12. And if our education follows that same format as their education, and I believe it does, that will be the order of the doctrine presented to us by Paul. And we've taken note of that as we've gone through it. So in note taker number one, let me give you now the four sonship skills and where they're found in Paul's epistles so that we can kind of track with that. So here's the first one. Wisdom was Romans 12, 3 through 16. Now, for many of you, you've already memorized this, and I realize that, but we're going to just do it again just the same. Justice is Romans 12, 17 to chapter 13 and verse 7. And we talked about the different components of godly justice. The next one is uh, judgment. That's Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. That was broken down into two component parts as well. And we finished up that book um, la uh, just before Thanksgiving. And now we're going to be in equity. And that is going to be Romans chapter 14, verse 1 to chapter 15, verse 7. So that is the breakdown of the sonship skills and the education uh, that we're going through here in the book of Romans. Now, in note taker figure two, what I want to do is add the next part of the doctrine. So we still have more to add here. So I'm not going to give, I've given you the whole thing except the line you need to fill in in your notes. So here it is, that last bit, Romans 14, 1 to 15, 7. The context is to the local assembly, and when I say body, then you could also apply that to the body of Christ, but especially to the local assembly. And the edifying result pertains to our liberty in Christ. So I've already given you a heads up on what it is that we're going to be delving into here when we talk about godly equity. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to define the word here because this word equity in the last years has gotten tossed around in everything from politics to you name it. And what happens is when people use that word, they kind of define it the way they want to define it. I want to talk to you about when we read that in Proverbs 1.3 where he mentions equity over there, and now Paul, although not using the word equity, is still talking about this very issue 
starting in Romans 14, 1, how is the Bible defining this term? In other words, what, what definition is the Bible using here? And so I went, of course, to the Oxford English Dictionary. And so let me give you this whole entry because it was very insightful. A lot of good work gets done here. So, um, well, you know what? I, I, again, I thought I had that right there on the PowerPoint, but I don't. But if you're looking at it in your notes, let me just say, here it is. Equity is the quality of being equal or fair, impartiality, even-handed dealing. Now, some people want to say that equity means everybody ought to have the same thing. But look, that's not exactly what the Bible is going to be talking about. It's this part that follows now. And what you see in parenthesis following that in your notes, that's the important part that we need to be looking at when we talk about equity in the biblical sense. The Latin equitas was somewhat influenced in meaning uh, by being adopted as the ordinary rendering of the Greek word epike, which, which meant reasonableness and moderation in the exercise of one's rights and the disposition to avoid insisting on them too rigorously. That's very interesting that they would put that in with the definition of equity because that's the part that we're really after in this study. Moderation in the exercise of one's rights and the disposition to avoid insisting on them too rigorously because that's exactly going to be what Paul is going to set the parameters for starting in Romans chapter 14 and verse 1. And so, and by the way, he's doing this with a particular purpose in mind. And it is not just the issue, and I'm going to say this about three different times during this session. It is not just the issue of everybody getting along with each other. It is that, but that's not it. In almost every commentary that I have on the book of Romans, and I've probably got about 14 or 15 of them, uh, the sad part about those commentaries are only about two of those understand right division. But those commentaries still tend to look at this like we can sum all of this up by saying what Paul is after is we just need to get along and be nice with each other. Well, now, that, that's not to say what I'm saying is not saying there's not anything wrong with getting along with people or being nice to folks. But there is something way more than that that Paul is trying to accomplish. All right, now let me talk to you about when you first got these notes. Now, you, got, you guys got your books today, but I hope that you knew that we were coming into Romans 14 and that you had read ahead. And what I wanted you to do was read Romans 14, 1 to 15, 7. And using those, those studies that we did on how to study the Bible, put together a summary statement of what this whole section of Scripture is about. Now, I hope you did that, and there's some blanks there in your book for you to do that. If you haven't done that yet, then please do that. But do it by reading and rereading, getting an idea, and in your own words, summarize it. I'm going to give you mine, but not yet. First thing I want to do is give you some that I gleaned out of my commentaries. And, um, and while I don't think they're entirely off base, I think they're missing the point. And I, that's what we cannot afford to do. So let me give you a couple of these on the PowerPoint. One of these commentaries said that what Paul is after in this section of Scripture, and by the way, almost all of them recognize that it went from 14.1 to 15.7. I, I thought that was pretty incredible that they actually kind of got the division right. But one of them said, this is instructions regarding our personal convictions. <laughs> well, look, once you go through this, I think you're going to discover Paul is, the issue here is not about your personal convictions or even theirs back in Rome. Not even talking about their personal convictions. Again, you'll see why in a moment. But, but before I completely throw that under the bus, can I just say to you that years ago, 
I might have written that summary statement. So now we'll look at some things that I certainly didn't understand back then and see how this changes. Here's the next one that I got out of a commentary. Settling difficult and delicate questions between Jews and Gentiles respecting food and the observance of particular days, rites, etc. Well, there probably, in fact, there was a large group of Jews in the church at Rome. There was. But the issue here is not about how, again, you'll see it as we work through the passage. It's not about how to settle those differences. That's not what Paul is talking about here. And again, I'm just going to say that to prove that you'll see it as we work through the passage. Here's the next thing I got out of a commentary. In things indifferent, Christians should not condemn each other, particularly with respect to different kinds of food and observation of certain days. Well, the key, the, the, the key word here that really makes this difficult to say that that's what Paul's after is when they write things indifferent. Uh, Paul is not interested here on telling people how to settle their differences on minor issues that really don't matter. Actually, he's talking about a situation that matters so much that it is the first time he brings up the judgment seat of Christ in connection with it, talking about us giving an account for it. So this is not about minor issues that really don't matter. Because in this commentary, here's what the guy was saying. I understand what he's saying, but... But look, he's just saying, look, it, we argue, you, you can argue over the important stuff, but over stuff that doesn't matter, Paul is just saying, just don't, don't get into it about that. It doesn't make any difference. But that's not what this, chap, this, this chapter and the next seven verses, the next chapter are all about. Okay, uh, here's the next one. The duty of enlightened Christians toward, a weak, toward weak brethren. Now, this one is, I think, absolutely on the target. It's just not complete. And I'll show you what I think is missing and why that's important. So I'm not just being nitpicky. I'm walking you through the process of how to form a summary statement. Now I'm going to give you these examples that all of them have elements of, you know, something good about them but they're either missing something or they're kind of off the point or, or whatever. All right, and, and that, in this case, I just think it's incomplete. The next one is the Christian and matters of conscience. That is not primarily what this is about, and that, that one is probably not close. Uh, the next one is don't judge others. I remember seeing that in bold caps up at the top of the heading in the commentary when we got to chapter 14, and... Um, Look, there's terminology in here that will make people think that's what's going on here. But that is not the primary issue. And when you say it that way, it's very misleading from what Paul is actually talking about. And here's the last one. Christians should get along with each other. And, and while I agree Christians ought to be able to get along it misses the very core of what Paul is spending a chapter and a half talking about. So now that we've kind of gone through all the wrong ones, if you haven't done this yet, and you're going to be doing that this week, and I hope you will, then just kind of pay attention to that as you're reading through um, Romans uh, 14 and the first seven verses of chapter 15. One more thing I want to say to you before I give you my summary statement. And that is, and we've talked about this a number of times. Do you realize that a lot of times when we're obeying the doctrine, you wind up doing maybe the same thing that you would have done before. Or you're doing the same thing that maybe someone who's not even saved they do that in their life. The only real difference is why you're doing it. And I've talked to you before about why the why is important. Motivation, 
what is making you do this? That is important to God. Now, I know that people get, get a little exasperated with that, and they go, look, isn't it enough that I'm just doing the right thing? Why do I have to do it for the right reason? Does it matter? If I give in the offering, does it matter why I give in the offering? If I, if I study the Bible, does it matter why I'm studying the Bible? You know, if I'm getting along with people, does it matter why? Well, you know, you know the obvious answer to that. The obvious answer is, of course it matters. It ma yes, it matters. In fact, actually, it matters every bit as much of, the, of what it is that you're doing. So, I'm going to give you an example of that just to remind you of it. And I'm going to take you over to 1 Corinthians. It's a passage we're all familiar with. Here it is, 1 Corinthians 13, 3. And where Paul writes, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Now what is Paul saying? I can make these very sacrificial acts to the nth degree, but if I don't do it for the right reason, it, do, it doesn't do any good. No, that's right. God looks at that and he just counts that as nothing. So you did that, you actually did that for nothing. So I'm giving you that example to say that it's not only what our Father, not, we're not only doing what our Heavenly Father would do, we're doing it for the same reasons that he would do it. And if we don't do it for those reasons, folks, we're not like him and therefore we are not being godly. And that's the whole, that's the whole issue of, of all the, that Paul is writing here. So the point here is that Paul is not just asking the members of the Roman assemblies to get along with each other by not judging each other because that is really going to miss the point of the passage. Now I'm saying that with the benefit of studying through the passage. For now, just kind of have that in your mind and then we'll look at that as we study through. Now... When we put together a summary statement of all of chapter 14 and the first seven verses of chapter 15, it is not only, why did I just go into that little diatribe? Because as you get a summary statement together, it's not just about what it is you're supposed to do, but I think it also has to include in that summary statement why you are doing it. That's why I said that one was incomplete, because it just talked about what you do. But see, if you just talk about what you do, Buddhism may do that. Islam may do that. A person that doesn't even believe in God may do that. But they won't be doing it for the same reason your Heavenly Father would be doing it. You see, and there's the critical difference. So I'm going to point you to two verses as I read through this that kind of became the foundation for my summary statement. One of them's in chapter 14 and one's in chapter 15. So let me give them to you. Here they are. First one's Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith one may edify another. Here's the second one. Chapter 15, verse 2. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. What's the common ground between those two verses? Well, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, to, okay, I, all right. So Linda had a Kleenex up there and I could have phone. So, all right, yeah. Edification is the commonality between those. Now, I'm going to give you my summary statement and then I'm going to give you some other verses that I put with those two. I just pick out two verses. But when I was reading through, I noticed that. So here's my summary statement. Managing our liberty in Christ to the edification of our fellow members and the flourishing of God's work in the assembly. So I've actually got a couple of things going on there. Not only do I see something happening, happening edificationally for individuals within the assembly, but I also see the edification of the assembly as a whole, as a unit. And so that's why I have the and in the middle of that. So with that in mind, now let me turn you over 
to these other verses that I was also looking at. So take a look with me here in Romans 14, 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Now, if this doesn't make any sense to you, you have to understand that one of the issues here is that here's a guy who is uh, eating meat and, um, and then... And, 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 now, I know instantly you're going to run over to Corinthians where they're asking the question, is it okay to eat meat that's been offered to idols? But Paul doesn't talk about this meat being offered to idols in Romans. He just is talking about it just this way. And there's another guy that only eats herbs is how Paul writes it over there. And so he's, you know, offended over this. Well, so Paul says, don't destroy a a, a weaker brother. Here's the next one in Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And here's the next one in 14, 20. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. And we'll talk about the last part of that verse when we get over there. But for now, understand, here's what we've got. Let me back up and show you this. Don't destroy him. That's an individual. The kingdom is supposed to be righteousness and peace and joy. And don't destroy the work of God. So you know what I see when I look at that is I see don't do something that is going to be destructive to an individual within your assembly. And then with this last one, don't do something that is going to be detrimental to the assembly as a whole. So when I wrote my summary statement, that's why I not only included the edification issue out of those first two verses, but the fact that this has something to do with destroying a single individual or even negatively impacting the assembly as a unit, as a body. And so those are the things that are in my mind. And so I just kind of wanted to walk you through that so you could see what I was looking at there. Now, you might write something different, and that is perfectly okay. I'm just trying to walk you through the process a little bit so that you uh, can develop the ability to do that. Now, here's something I want to say about this because this is where I get to explain and say for the second time that this is way more than just get along with each other and quit majoring on the minors. It's, it's more than that. And here's how, here's how I want to explain it. These four... Oh, I got this up from last week, don't I? Uh, I should have erased that. Sorry. These four sonship skills. And, and we did this on your note taker earlier. We uh, put these by the verses. Now, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to do something with this. That's why I'm putting them up on the board. Because these four sonship skills, these now, all four of these put together, are going to bring this assembly to a whole new level of relationship. The next book we're going to be in is going to be in the book of Ephesians. I want to take you over to Ephesians and I want to show you something that he says now because you've been through the foundational doctrine of Romans. And he doesn't say that. But because you have been, the Ephesians have been through the foundational doctrine of Romans, they are now able to do something as a body that they had not been able to do before. So let's read this verse in Romans. I'm sorry, in Ephesians. Ephesians 4.16 from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Did you feel like you just walked in the middle of the movie and you don't really understand what's going on? So let me, I, I interrupted the verse right there. It's why the dots because Now, in your notes, I didn't do it like this because I don't have the ability to give it to you piece by piece in your notes. 
But you know what I did? Is I interrupted it with a parenthesis there, and I asked a question there. So he's talking about the whole body being, so let me just put this up. Okay, Mark said, get rid of those markers when they're, I didn't make it in the can, okay. He said, get rid of those markers. Oh, gosh. That was just as bad, isn't it? Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, I put his eye out. Okay. All right. Fitly joined to together and compacted. Now, he says... Fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. Here's my question. Every part of what? Well, look back at the verse. From whom the whole body. So the answer is, so here's, here's the, here, here there, there's, well, you know what? I, I, again, I, I thought I had this in pieces here. It's every part of the body. We are all parts of this body right here, part of this assembly. And when we treat our fellow members with selfless, loving kindness, remember the, it's actually K, loving, loving kindness, Remember that? I'm going to get now. We've made an acronym. Does anybody remember what the next one is? Huh? Thank you. Next one? Meekness. Last one? Benevolence. Okay. When we treat our fellow members with those with, with with those five core features of godly love that we learned earlier we are effectually working in this assembly to produce a result in other words when we treat each other this way something comes out of that you don't have to manufacture it the fact that you're doing that will manufacture it and what is it now we get to complete the verse so here it is the, 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 according to the effectual working, in the measure of every part, is this, is this not, sorry, I don't know why my PowerPoint is doing this, but it says, here's what it does. It maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself, in love. What, wh where did the love come in? Right here. Right? Okay, but, remember, but notice that the, the tone has switched. Now we're not just talking about the edifying of individuals. Now we're talking about what? The edification of the body as a whole. So I want to paint a picture for you because this is what's going on. When this last thing of equity... When these four now, and we combine these in our treatment of each other, and we employ those core features of godly love, not only is something happening in each of us individually, yes, but now something begins to happen to us as a body where we get fitly joined together and compacted so that this body now can edify itself as a unit, as a whole. And, and, and so now I need to take that a step further. As the members of any local assembly begin to respond to each other out of those features of godly love and living out of the doctrine that was started, let me just put this up here now. So that's that doctrine that started back in Romans 12, 3 and runs all the way to 15, 7. That's the end of the part that we're in now. When we live out of that doctrine and we treat each other accordingly, what happens is this assembly begins to get transformed so that 
It is fitly joined, it is compacted, and it is knit together in love. You say, okay, so big deal. Why, why is that a big deal? Why, why do we want that? What difference does it make if that happens or not? Because when that happens, so I, the reason it's a big deal is because something happens that you don't get to see with your physical eyes yet. But it happens. And I want to show you this in the book of Ephesians. I'm sorry, in the book of Philippians. Philipp, because what's going to happen, let, let me just say it this way. Once an assembly is fitly joined together and compacted and knit together in love, then it's conversation. Now, you can say two people are talking, and so we're having a conversation. But you also understand that when the Bible uses the word conversation, it is also talking about the manifestation of your life. And what happens is, when an assembly does this, that whole assembly, the life of that assembly now gets manifested beyond just this world. Hey, the world around us is supposed to look when this assembly gets to that place and go, wow, there's really something happening with those folks. But now that manifestation is going to go outside of this world and be manifested to everything in the heavenly places. And I want to show you that in the book of Philippians. And here it is. I'm sorry, I gave you that in Colossians. And I should have read this verse to you because that's where we got the knit together thing. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. So the part I'm trying to pull out of here, so you, here's what you have. You have fitly joined together and compacted. And that's the, that's the Ephesians thing, right? And now knit together in love, okay? That's the Colossians thing. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the result of that. So all of that equals a conversation. This marker is terrible. In heaven. Try this one. I know, I know. I'm about to, oh, God, that's so much better. Okay. Wow, I got down to the end. Okay, so now let me read the Philippians thing. By the way, you realize the section when we're finishing up Romans, the next section? It, it's, we're going to, I mean, I know, you said, well, what about 1st, 2nd Corinthians and Galatians? Remember 1st Corinthians is corrective for those uh, saints that they got sidetracked by the world. Galatians is uh, uh, corrective for those that went back under the law. But when you're talking about the education itself, now you're talking about Ephesians. And so when you have Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, that's the next part of the doctrine. And so this, that, that there's Ephesians. Here, here's Philippians. That's what that's going to be. And that one's Colossians. So now let me show you this in Philippians. For our conversation is in heaven. He's not, you know, when he says for our conversation, I don't think Paul is talking about our individual lives. When he says our, I think he's talking more corporately our. He didn't say my conversations in heaven. He says, or your conversations in heaven. He says our conversations in heaven. Because when an assembly, by the way, I, I, look, I've known about this for a long time. We haven't talked a whole lot about it because, it's, because we're over here in Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, and you need all the stuff in Romans to get there. But what I'm trying to do is tell you, here's the answer to the question, why is this a big deal? This is a big deal getting these things down and living out of that doctrine of Romans 12 to 15. It's a big deal because this now has gotten to the place where this whole group can come together as a body 
and actually function as a single unit instead of a bunch of individuals just doing stuff, we now actually begin to function as a unit. And when that gets manifested, God puts that on display in the heavens for everything to see, for everything up there to see. God's angels will see it, Satan's angels will see it, and the creature will see it. And why is, that impo- why, why is that such a big deal that the life of some assembly gets put on display that way? Because this, this small assembly here is supposed to be a microcosm of the whole body of Christ when they get up there. And, and, and what are we supposed to do when we get up there? We're supposed to be fitly joined together and knit together in love. And that means we know how to do some things as a unit and as a body. And you know what God is doing? He is putting on display ahead of time the fact that there's a, there's a small body that knows how to do that. And you say, well, does that mean anything? Of course it does, and you already know. Let me take you back to Romans 8. Back to Romans 8, but keep in mind what the creature is waiting for. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. You know what we're talking about right here? We're talking about the manifestation of the sons of God. Why why is the creature waiting for that? Because when it sees... You say, "Does does the creature see us? What the creature sees is when this body gets to that place that it is now beginning to do that, God makes that manifest in the heavens. That's why Philippians says, for our conversation, our life is made manifest in the heavens. And then the creature knows there's a group down there that knows how to do this. Would that be encouraging to the creature? Why? That's right. He won't be very good because he is under the bondage of corruption and he knows that 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 body is going to deliver him from the bondage of corruption. And now he knows there's someone that knows how to do that. Someone that can, can, can actually accomplish that. So when the doctrine is effectually working inside a local assembly, that that assembly will have its own Christ-like manifestation put on display in the heavens. Now you're not going to see that with your eyes. You're not going to be able to go out at night and look up at the starry sky and go, oh, there's, and you say, how is God going to do that? Is, is he putting up a billboard in the heavenly place? How is he doing that? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know exactly, I don't think the billboard idea is the way he does that, by the way, but I don't know exactly how God is going to do that. I hope I will be able to, to find out something about that. But until I do, I do know this, that as, as we put all of these sonship skills into practice in this assembly to the edifying of this body so that now it's not just here's a bunch of individuals that know something, but now here here are individuals that are fitly joined together and compacted and knit together so that now we can actually begin to function as a unit and as a whole. By the way, time out. To do that, you've got to be able to say to yourself, is what I am about to do, is that, is that edifying or helpful to this body? If I, when I, when everything you choose to do and not to do, when you get to the point where you go, look, how, how does that affect the rest of this body? Now you know what you're doing. Now you're asking the question about, how this is going to take place. And as we live out of that, now the life of Christ is not just being made manifest in you individually. 
It's been made manifest in this whole body as a single unit. And God makes that life manifest, that conversation manifest in the heavenly places. And it inspires the creature. I believe it causes the angels of God to rejoice. And I think it causes all of Satan's angels to be discouraged. Because they see that ha taking place. Now, having, so having said all of that, what have I got left here? Hmm. Having said all of that, let me wind up by saying this. That's why these scriptures in, in equity, remember 14.1 four, to 15.7 is about way more than just getting along. That's why this is way more than don't judge each other. That's why this is about something more than don't major on the minors. Or how to settle differences between Jews and Gentiles. You know what he's really talking about here? Is that the body now, that's where the focus is now beginning to change. And we're going to start looking at this corporately as a body. And that's supposed to impact our role within it. The decisions that we make. What, we're, what we will do and what we won't do. Because now we realize it doesn't just have an effect on us, it has an effect on the body as a whole. So that's the point. That, that's why I wanted to take that little side trip is because that, that explains why I keep saying to you this is not just about how to deal with your personal convictions. <laughs> this is way more. Okay. Um, one last thing. Remember we talked about the thing about the creature and Linda gave the, the right answer. The reason that the creature that's important when it sees that manifestation of that kind of life in an assembly is because it's going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption but I also want to say that there is a sense, not totally because these bodies aren't yet redeemed, but there is a sense in which when a body begins, a church, an assembly begins to operate this way, there is a sense in which we deliver ourselves from elements, not all, but from elements of the bondage of corruption because of how we're able to function together as a body. And so it doesn't just work that way for the creature, but it also works that way for us. Okay, now, having said, having said that, let me take you to note taker number three, and let's take a look at the pattern of doctrine uh, here in this section on equity. And here it is right here. The first one is the godly thinking, and what you're filling in is that part in yellow that is going to be chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. There's the godly thinking. Now, so if you read through all of this, you'll, you'll see that's where the break is. The second one is chapter 14, verses 13 to 23. That is the godly living. And since it runs to 15, 7, it makes it pretty obvious what the last is. The godly labor is chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. So... I, I have listed in your notes that first part on the godly thinking, but I've got two sessions to do today, and I've only got a minute and a half to finish this session. Okay. Yeah, how come? So, because uh, time flies when you're having fun. And um, I can, so here we go. Okay. So I want to just show you, look, let me just start off and just show you something here at beginning in verse 1. Look how it starts out. I'm not going to read the whole passage because you can do that on your own. But just to start us in verse 1, him that is weak in the faith. So what does it mean to be weak in the faith? Now, this is not faith in the sense of I put my faith in Christ as my Savior and he, you know, forgave my sin. It's not that kind of faith. Now what we're talking about is in the faith. And the faith is the total of all that Christ revealed to Paul about the mystery. That's the faith, okay? 
So I, 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 I give you that in a couple of different ways in your, in, in your notes. What I just want you to understand is this doesn't mean that he's talking about someone who is not sure if they're saved or not. He's not talking about someone who maybe believes and then maybe doesn't believe. But when he talks about someone who is weak in the faith, he is talking about someone who has an area of the doctrine somewhere that they have not yet learned. Yeah, they just, they're just not aware of it. They're, yeah. So a person can be justified unto eternal life, but maybe they're not aware of Paul's teaching in sanctification. Maybe they don't know that uh, to live out of... They think the way to live for God is by keeping the law. And Paul says, don't do that. Put your spiritual life to death. But they don't know that. So in that area of sanctification, guess what? They are weak in the faith. There's a whole lot of different things that may cause someone uh, to be weak in the faith. It may be in the area of their sanctification like that. Or it could be, as in the case of what we're talking about here our Christian liberty. So that's what we're going to be talking about here. Um, so weak in the faith is not being uh, uh, used to describe a brother who is sinful or rebellious. It's not talking about someone who uh, is not really sure if they're saved. It is talking about someone who has an area of doctrine that has not yet they're either not aware of it, or if they're aware of it, they have not yet come to have that doctrine work in them to convince them. They're just, they're just ignorant of it. And I don't mean that in a disparaging type way. They just don't know about it. So it's not talking about someone who's living in sin. And, uh, and so we need to, anyway, I, and let me just set this distinction. I think I showed you this verse off the cuff one day. But look, there are different ways to treat different people. Uh, here's a brother that's rebellious. Here's a brother that's just weak. Here's a brother that's, you know, something else. And the Bible says you're going to treat each one of those differently. Now, let me give you an example of that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to work through this one. Here it is. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly and love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the, what's that word? Weak. Where do you, now Paul just says it like that when he gets to Thessalonians. You know what that means? By the time you get to Thessalonians, you should have already been through some kind of doctrine that tells you what does it mean to warn the unruly? What, is it, what does it mean to um, comfort the feeble-minded? And then what does it mean to support the weak? You know what you're about to learn right here? You're, you're about to learn what it means to support the weak. So once you learn this and this doctrine is in you, by the time you get over the Thessalonians, all he has to do is write one verse and go, remember this, remember this, remember this. And you go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I treat different situations in different ways. And those are some of the things that Paul is trying to do here. Um, so I think what we're going to do is going to end this session here I know you have more in your notes, but I, can, I think I can put that together in just a few sentences, and it'll be a great introduction to the next session.